El día de hoy tenemos unas visitas de unos compañeros. ¿Cómo ustedes quieren aportar en esta, en esta visión de las lenguas que muchas veces se han ido matando con la gente opresora, digamos? Gobiernos corruptos que viven gobernando los estados a ojos cerrados si ven la realidad de la sociedad. This is not a two-person tent. Some places where the most languages are in danger of extinction are kind of backwaters. <laughs> Sure, there's risk. If you get really sick, or there was some kind of political problem, who knows if anyone would ever hear about you. This is an area that's been widely reported to be heavily controlled by Noxalite separatists. We didn't know what to expect at all, really. The skills that you possess help document a language that is going to go extinct in your lifetime. So we're going to have a Q&A session with uh, director, producer, and one of the linguists. So Dan Miller, <laughs> competing, uh, Jeremy Newberger, and also our linguist, Gregory Anderson. So they're here. Come on up, guys. <laughs> And so you know the mic's right here if you have a question. We also have some on Adori page as well. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for coming. This is Dan Miller. I'm Jeremy Newberger. And if you don't know him by now. <laughs> Shall I start with one of the questions here? Sure. From Ann Arbor. Besides encouraging native speakers to continue using their languages, how else do you try to preserve the language? Okay. Um, well, obviously we, as was seen in the film, we record uh, in both audio and uh, digital video format. Um, the idea behind that is to preserve a record uh, that would be accessible to both community members as well as the community of scientists who might be interested in that, uh, learning that language or learning something about the language. Um, so I'm sure most of you know linguistics isn't necessarily learning a language can be, but it's of, often learning about a language or studying it in ways that other people might not think about learning them. Um, now, um, in terms of what we personally do with our work, uh, we both um, make sure that the data is repatriated in a format that's usable to the community. Um, so if they only have uh, audio, analog audio, then we'll copy them into audio tapes that they can use if they have uh, um, v VHS type format or um, VCD like they have in West Africa or in um, whatever format is appropriate uh, to be um, deliverable. Um, we have our own copies of these things. We archive them in endangered language archives as well so that um, they can be in multiple places in case you know, any one of them is destroyed by some you know, unfortunate act. Um, and. Um, we also not only encourage the speakers to learn and use the languages, but um, we train community members uh, in uh, techniques of documentation and basic analysis that would be for their own purposes, so uh, to help them further the process of uh, documenting uh, and maintaining the languages. Um, we can also try to help increase awareness uh, through public awareness and also uh, meetings with government and educational officials so that um, there's less hostile environment towards maintaining the languages within the communities um, because having some kind of external validation from a state supported uh, apparatus is uh, an important symbolic uh, feature for uh, ensuring the environment or the ecology if you will for preserving or maintaining the language is um, maximally met. 
I think also uh, Greg and David's mere interest in the language uh, or you know any linguistic scientific an outsider's interest in the language is sort of a reverse of what the speakers are used to which is decades of shame and humiliation at speaking their language so just that interest alone sparks a renewed interest among the community to, to learn and speak their language yes okay. I have about 150 questions but I'm trying to not be greedy um, how many field linguists roughly are out there right now doing this work, and what language family is Chilean? Okay. Um, the first, second question, there's two part question. How many field linguists are out doing this kind of work, and um, a specific question on what language family Chilean belongs to. The second question is very easy to answer. It's a Turkic language, um, so it's a relative, although distant, of Turkish and Uzbek and better known Turkic languages. Um, how many field linguists there are? Now that's a difficult question to answer um, because it kind of depends on how you define linguist. Um, very many uh, minority language communities around the world have language activists who may function as de facto linguists. That they may not have training, formal training in a university setting in linguistic methodology or linguistic courses or whatever. Um, so, I mean. You might call them linguists, you might not. How many trained linguists who, have, who are card-carrying members of the academy, that is, they've achieved a PhD in linguistics and are doing field linguistics? Well, uh, not many of them can do that full-time, of course, because um, they have teaching and other advising responsibilities within a university appointment. Um, and uh, so it's a very small percentage of linguists that would be dedicated full-time to this kind of work. Um, Part-time dedication, um, would, that number would go up significantly, but still it's only a fraction of however many um, linguists there actually are. I don't think, I'm not exactly sure what the membership of the LSA is, but it's in the several thousands, I would think, and um, fewer than 10 percent probably are actually active field linguists. Some 20 or a quarter maybe are, are ones who've done it or something in the past, but may not uh, currently and or will in the future. Um, so there, there's more of it now than there was, but it's still a, a fairly small minority within the field. And that's true in most countries now. There are countries like Brazil, for example, where the vast majority of people who are linguists are field linguists. So um, it does vary from country to country. Ask that question again after our film uh, has its uh, premiere on PBS in the spring, and it might have a larger number. Right. It seems that all of them have blogs. <laughs> yes. Our film has brought a number of closet linguists out. <laughs> Uh, of the woodwork. Everyone has, uh, it seems, a, or a number of people have an interest in linguistics and languages. And so. It seems like from the film that your work has touched on the lives of a lot of people who are ashamed of who they are uh, for a long time. Do you have any plans to go back and follow up? Uh, I'd be really happy to see what happened to the uh, Siberian guy who went to the forest to write down all that stuff in the book and then threw it out. Right. Um, actually, we, we maintain connections with all of the communities that are in the film. Um, so, tell me what you just said. The, 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 uh, oh, yeah. Um, in fact, we were just in Siberia this past uh, summer uh, working again with uh, Vasya and a couple of the other remaining speakers. Unfortunately, several of the people featured in the film have now died. Um, but um, he is, uh, you can see a great change in Vasya personally. Um, so, for example, he, his wife is a passive speaker of the language, that is, she understands it but doesn't actually speak it. Um, and he pretty much speaks to her almost exclusively in Chulim now, which has changed radically from the way it was when we first met him. Um, and she just denied even knowing the language, as often is the case. She has, you know, her, her parents were active speakers, so she has a passive knowledge. She's the generation that, that um, has rejected, essentially, the language, as Vasya is himself, but he personally didn't. Um, and um, he said to us, um, just as we were leaving, you know, how thankful he was, again, to see us, of course. You know, it's like we're long lost family at this point. But um, he uh, was saying that, you know, I, I used to be embarrassed about who I am, but I no longer feel embarrassed about being Chulim. Um, and I'm happy to, to have people know that, that I speak the language and that, that I am who I am. Um, and that's something that he himself couldn't have imagined a few years ago. So. Um, yeah, we absolutely do keep uh, contacts and, and make regular visits back to these places. Hi, um, I was spe specifically interested in the example um, when you were in Bolivia of the individual who 
um, thought that he was speaking in the language that you were studying, but was actually speaking to in Quechua. Right. And I wondered, um, how common is it for speakers of these um, smaller languages to not know the boundaries between their particular language and, and other languages within their countries? Right. Um, so the question was, how common is it for you not to be aware of what language it is that you're speaking? Um, I would say it's actually more common than you might imagine. Uh, and in, in the particular case of Kalawaya and Quechua, you can understand if you know what Kalawaya is like, why someone might think that they were speaking it um, even if they weren't. Um, so the Quechua variety that Kalawaya um, is based on, um, so Kalawaya is not only a secret language, it's a so-called mixed language. And this means that it has uh, a, a, a Quechua component and a non-Quechua component. Its grammar is essentially Quechua. Uh, but it's um, the lexicon, that is the, the source of the words in the language, are generally non-Quechua. Um, and, um, and, and this sort of, uh, would see, you could see that if, you know, the boundaries there might not be so clear cut because um, if uh, there's variation in any community on the way people use words, uh, you, know, um, you know, there's some classic ones in the United States, like if you're at the uh, grocery store and they ask you, uh, if you need some container to carry the items uh, that you've just purchased. In some parts of the United States, they'll ask you if you need a bag. In some parts, they'll ask you if you need a sack. In some parts, they'll ask you if you need a tote. Okay? Uh, so um, these are things, uh, uh, carbonated drinks. In some parts of the country, it's pop. Some places, they call it soda. In Boston, they call it tonic. Uh, down in Texas, uh, you could have Sprite or 7-Up or Orange, and they'll say, do you want a Coke? Uh, so, um, the, you know, the, there's lexical variation in any community that some people are aware of and some people aren't. And when the language differs primarily lexically from another language, you could see how someone might think, because it turns out he did have a few words that were Kalawaya. Uh, if we did, say, a hundred word list of Kalawaya, he had half a dozen that were Kalawaya as opposed to Quechua. So, in his mind, and being that he was the traditional um, that is, that his profession was that of a healer, the only people who are licensed to use this language. Um, you could see how he had uh, the erroneous belief that he had it. Now you compare that with someone like Max Chura, who has full use, or um, the uh, other man, um, his name is Don Francisco Nina Condes, who was ringing the bell over my head towards the end of the Bolivian scene. Um, he's, they're fully functional users of this language. So there's, even within um, this community, there's a sort of continuum of of expertise in the language, if you will. So um, he, um, the fact is, is that outside of two healers meeting each other, Kalawai isn't usually used uh, as a language that of conversation. Um, it can be used in that, uh, so it's not a purely ritual language, and it's capable of saying anything as long as people use it. So you know, we created sentences that they had nothing to do with the the ritual, and they were able to to translate them and use them, uh, and say, oh yeah, yeah, of course you'd say that, you could say that. We, we don't, but um, you know, if you wanted to say the llama is eating the grass, you could say that. It doesn't happen to come up in the ritual. So it, that would show that the Kalawai is, in fact, not just a memorized ritual language. It has some function still with, as an identity marker for that specifically enfranchised elite group of healers who can use it. Um, a question from Ann Arbor. Uh, did the Kalawai medicine help you feel better? Uh, absolutely. Um, it made the rest of us feel better, too. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't the only one who was sick there, incidentally. No, but the crankiest. Uh, right. <laughs> and um, nor was I sick for that long since I got onto that um, traditional medicine very quickly. Um, so, well, you know, there was some artistic license with the, <laughs> with the timeline in the Bolivian segment in particular. Um, it's a physical impossibility to travel back and forth between uh, Charazani and La Paz, where the radio station is, in one day. Right. Uh, so <laughs> that was cut from different days. But the story was we met Bolivian Healing, uh, and it absolutely knocked that thing out of me. Within six hours, it was like I was never sick. Was we funny. don't know what he's talking about. Uh, it must have been the herbs he was eating. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good story. Yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering how deep you can get into a language with these things. Uh, take an example I'm familiar with, say, second or third generation Japanese speakers in the US don't know how to use any of the respect language, and it's horrifically difficult to learn. And you almost wouldn't realize it existed if you only look at people in these kind of small family groups. Um, just, so. Right, so the question is, um, well, it was a two-part two question, really. Um, 
I, I hear two different questions there. One, how deep can you get into the language in a relatively short time? Well, we spent a lot more time than would appear <laughs> on these languages in the film, of course. A lot of preparation, and, 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 and of course, we were there more than three minutes or whatever, like it would seem in, yeah. in the film. So, um, uh, and yes, languages uh, which are um, either immigrant languages, like the example you gave of Jap second or third generation Japanese use, or uh, one's minority languages that are having increasingly narrower domains of use, there are certain areas where you see loss of original uh, structures. Now, um, is it only the case that this happens in endangered languages? No. All languages change uh, through time, and there's some natural variation and change which occurs across generations. If you were to sample a grandparent's generation versus a children's generation, even in a healthy language, you're going to find differences. Um, and um, very um, socially regulated and charged uh, language use, like honorifics of the type of structure you're talking about in Japanese, which are fairly common in, in East Asian languages. Uh, these are the, exactly the kinds of domains which, if you don't have that social context that necessitates the use of those, you would, you would lose them, much like you would lose irregularly used forms or uncommonly used forms. The, 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 sort of, the language can sort of fray at the periphery of its sort of functional domains, to use the technical term. Uh, and in just different kinds of rare forms or words. Um, Johnny Hill mentioned how, you know, I've forgotten some. And that, his first language is Chemehueve, but he still lost some aspects of it from remembering how he used to be able to speak to, say, his, his grandmother or whatever, or certainly the way she would speak with her, her um, peers. So, um, you know, uh, languages which are undergoing shift are threatened at multiple different levels. Um, it may be their functional domains are lost. It may be word areas are lost. Entire knowledge domains get lost as, as people shift their economies and their cultural practices, for example, like um, eco-management. Entire uh, semantic domains are lost. Um, so I mean, that's a common thing. But you kind of have to be careful about what you attribute to language endangerment uh, and just normal processes of change, which occur in all so-called healthy languages as well. Uh, what happens to dead languages, especially the documented ones? Um, are they simply forgotten? Dead undocumented languages? <laughs> dead and documented yeah. languages. Oh. Oh. Dead and documented. Well, um, why languages die is that their speakers no longer feel there is a function for them. Okay. Now, a language which has been documented, um, if you're talking about a, like a minority language today, it, it, it exists essentially perhaps in some digital archive or something uh, and in the minds of a few rememberers. Um, a documented language, say, like, uh, la well, Latin, you know, you could argue, is Latin really a dead language, okay? Latin developed into known spoken varieties, uh, which became the modern Romance languages, and then still contained a, uh, continued a parallel existence as the language of the Catholic Church. And, you know, dissertations were written in the early 20th century. I believe it was the official language of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So, so it's this, there was still some functional, uh, you know, use of Latin. Uh, a, a language which is clearly extinct and was documented is Sumerian. Okay, this is a language which, in fact, you know, documenting a language doesn't save it from disappearing, of course, because Sumerian is not only the oldest attested language, it's the first known extinct language. Uh, so, you know, it's, it was already out 4,000 years ago. Um, but uh, it was maintained as a literary language and a, as a ritual language in uh, the uh, Akkadian uh, communities that took over the Sumerians. Akkadian met its own similar fate at a subsequent time when it also was conquered later. So um, what we know is that um, we know a little bit more about Akkadian than we do about Sumerian. There's a lot about Sumerian we don't know, like how many of the things were pronounced, for example. Um, so it, it can sort of semi-survive in this state of semi-knowledge uh, forever, really, as long as, as someone puts in the effort to maintain that knowledge. Um, there was some point at which it was broken, of course, and that's why we don't know um, why, you know. In Sumerian, it's clear that it couldn't have been pronounced like we think, because otherwise they wouldn't have had 54 different ways of writing the same syllable. You know, it doesn't make any sense, okay? There, there had to have been some, some difference uh, between those, uh, either tone or this, this, the G actually was n or something, you know. It's like, there's something there we didn't know, but because it was already being learned as a dead language when it was being used essentially as a written language, there's only so much we'll ever know. 
Um, now, why do you want to record a language? Well, if you don't record a language, you can be sure that it will have no function to anyone ever. ever. But if you do have documentation, it may be that the, the social conditions that caused it to be lost in the first place have changed. We're seeing this in a lot of indigenous communities today, where uh, it's no longer the bad thing to assert your identity through the minority language. However, for some of these communities, it's too late, because the language is, too, is gone and wasn't really documented. Uh, and therefore, there's no possibility it can come back. Ones that are documented, there's at least the possibility. And we can see that with the right kind of environment, languages can be brought back from the actual you know, edge of extinction. Um, Hebrew, Cornish, yeah, Basque. exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, um, well, Basque never got to the point that like um, Cornish did, for example, because there's, quite yeah. Um, Hawaiian being another one in the US um, that is rightly pointed to as a success story. So the reason that they could be built back up is because there was, in, tho in those cases, at least either a, a very tiny but still extant speaker base or records that could be used to um, build up the language, as is happening in a few communities across the country Of course, right there's now. Wampanoag. Yeah, exactly. For which neither of those were true. Right. Um, another one is the uh, Huron Wyandot language from um, well, basically now Oklahoma and Canada, um, that essentially died out as a spoken language a while, uh, already a generation, if not two ago. And they've been working hard at um, revitalizing is the technical term we use for bringing it back um, from the brink of extinction or actual no longer being used as a spoken language. So that's, that's one where they've started um, singing songs in it at, at meetings and things. So it's gradually coming back, um, though it has no actual fluent first language users anymore. I also have a two-part two question. Um, are, are there certain aspects to a language that are just inherently pleasing to you as a linguist when you come across the language and, and begin to study it or hear it or see it? And then have you created languages? <laughs> <laughs> you were waiting for that one. <laughs> right. Um, the question, two-part, yes. Uh, anything inherently interesting about the languages that appeals to me and or um, have I created one? Well, the second one, no, not really. Um, when I was a little kid, you know, like, like anyone else, we did kind of things like that. But um, nothing <laughs> quite so advanced as like a full language with a syntax and a morphology and a phonology order. Um, personally, what do I like? Anytime, the more complicated the verb system is, the better. Um, so, uh, you know, the kinds of things that make most people run in terror, that's just when I start getting interested. Um, Cool sounds, of course. Another language we were that didn't make it into the film that we recorded in Bolivia is Chipaya. It's an incredibly interesting sounding language with like really terrifying consonant clusters and lots of adjectives and and an and amazingly bizarre sounding language from someone who's conditioned to hearing European or East Asian language. It doesn't sound anything like those. So I, you know, any kind of unusual sounds, of course, are appealing. Um, but once you get into sort of beyond the superficial. Um, you know, I like yeah complex stuff. Noun class systems, that's great. You know, it works well with me. Um, like you find in Bantu languages or something, or in, in some Southeast Asian languages, for example. Thanks. How often does the work that you do correlate or weave into other sorts of anthropological studies, such as the movement of early humans and establishment of you know certain clusters and groups? Um, so how much does our work inform other related uh, social scientific fields? Um, well, of course, we would like to think that it does. Um, we try to be informed by those ourselves. Uh, so um, both David and I have background training in anthropology as well as linguistics. So we have some understanding of the methodology. Um, and in, in, in also in our work, we've attempted to try to bring back those a little bit together because the fields have diverged considerably over the last half century or so. Um, but um, you know, I'm not an expert in archaeology or genetics or anything like that. I mean, I read the stuff. I find things as plausible as anyone else does in these things. Uh, but you know, I can't make an informed specialist decision about you know person X being right and person Y being wrong because they use this you know, crazy methodology or something. So then I have to 
call or write con you know, colleagues of mine who are actual specialists in this and say, you know, is this person a quack? Should I, should I read this? Uh, of course, if they say they're a quack, I'll still read it. But I'd like to know, uh, I'd like to know that 99% you know, of the field finds this you know, completely insane. And that's important for people taking this perspective of linguistics, because a lot of what gets out into the popular science areas uh, from linguistics are, in fact, fairly fringe uh, ideas about things. And um, so you need to know, you need to be informed. Like, like for example, Nostratic is a, this super family that supposedly includes Indo-European and Dravidian and a bunch of other language families from Eurasia. There are a few people that actively work in Nostratic, but it's an incredibly small number of people. But if you read Scientific American, for example, or Nature or Science, you'd think this kind of long-range linguistics is all that people do in linguistics, essentially. And it's, and it's, uh, that's one of the least scientifically grounded of in fields of inquiry within linguistics, and yet it seems to be the one that people are most latching on to. So, um, you know, that, in that way, you know, I, I am at least aware that I need to be careful about what we read in all these journals or whatnot, just because, you know, I only know the certain areas that we know. So, I mean, I'd, I'd like that our work would inform, um, I mean, the language hotspots model that I developed was informed by what I know about population movements and things, because it's a, a known fact that where you have epicenters of diversity, the archaeological record suggests are also um, old areas of inhabitation. So um, it, it's something that does correlate. So a deep level diversity of language families or language stocks is, is something where we find, um, I mean, even in, in highly diverse areas like in New Guinea, for example, the area that, that people must have populated New Guinea from is where you have the highest density of language families in New Guinea. You know, it's not the highest density of languages, it's the highest density of language families. And that's a deeper level, more old, if you will, level of diversity than, than the contemporary distribution of languages is. I have a question for Jeremy and Dan. What was it like traveling with these guys? <laughs> <laughs> Try and get a word in. <laughs> no, I, I was telling, uh, we were talking about outside. Uh, we, we spent a lot of time driving trying to get to the places that you saw in the film. Uh, and we clocked a lot of road trip hours with these guys. And you know, when they were staying in tents and trying to get them up, we were too. So you know, we bonded with them as you do with people that you're traveling with. But Greg, in particular, will fill every minute of silence <laughs> with something to say. And like, it's, you're just in awe that he's got so much to tell you about everything. Uh, so I'd say you know, it was a riot to, to follow these you guys around. But, yes, we learned know. a lot. We, uh, they continue to visit these communities. And I was just you know, saying outside, we're, every time I hear that they're going without us tagging along, I get a little, a little jealous that we're not there to like. Another you know, film then? In the uh, maybe. Well, you guys are remembered fondly there, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> they always ask about you. Right. So. <laughs> Yeah, you know, we weren't a set. We weren't like a separate entity from them. We were with them, and when we would go into these various villages, uh, they didn't see us as like a, a camera crew that was making a film. They just saw us as part of the entourage of David and Greg. Right. And even that ceremony you saw uh, Max conduct, he was you know hovering a bowl of hot coals over our head as we held our cameras. <laughs> he just saw us as part of the ceremony. Mm -hmm. Although tense moments get tense out there for everyone. Yeah. So it's uh, when you're. When these guys were sort of up against them trying to document a language, you know, before the speakers uh, die or, you know, in a short period of time, we're trying to get the material we needed for our movie. And like those two pressures, you know, on top of the fact that we're interacting with cultures that are completely unfamiliar to, uh, you know, David and Greg when they're in a pilot expedition and us because, you know, we've, we've never been to these places, it becomes pretty, pretty tense as well. So. It, it only came to a, a fever pitch once and that was in a a small hotel in Chirasani where there was only one outlet and they had to charge their gear and we had to charge our gear. Uh, I had then, suppressed that, I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> there were sparks that night. Right. Yeah, power can be a great equalizer. Yes. Access to power when you're on the road. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I'm wondering if there's any overlap within linguistics in studying the physiology of language. If there's things like looking universally at how people say maybe their first words would be mother or something like that. If, if, if it tends to be the same kind of mouth action, or well, is it varied? Yeah. Um, baby talk words uh, cross-linguistically have certain commonalities. Um, but there's a functional reason why that's the case. Um, there are certain sounds that kids make recognizable earlier than other sounds. 
um, labials, as you correctly identified, and dentals, like da, ta, 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 da, da. Now, there's no inherent correlation between, um, some people try to say this, between like M's and mother because of like, you know, babies nursing, like, <laughs> or something like that. Um, just to give you an example, in Georgian, which is a language from Georgia, which was in the news uh, recently, um, the uh, um, word mama means father, and the word deda means mother. I mean, and so basically, there's you get often like a simple consonant vowel syllable copied like that, mama da da like that, because kids, anyone who listens to early babbling and children will hear that they'll do this. The technical term for this is reduplication. So they'll reduplicate syllables, common syllables. And there is a universal tendency among human groups to identify those first sound sequences with meaningful entities in the child's slash family's life. And what's more meaningful than the parents' own or brothers, sisters, whatever, identifying, you know. So it's, there's a very common tendency to correlate early articulations with baby talk forms of uh, kin terms, okay? So that's meaning where the media connection is. right. Well, I mean, that they you construct the meaning by making it mean that essentially, uh, which is why baby talk words, you know, they, Georgian has the same phenomenon except for that they divide it up. They, the referent of the the kin is different. You know, it's the exact opposite that you expect from an Indo-European perspective. Okay, but that's just because. Um, well, I mean, like the word dada, daddy, you know, tata, whatever, this, it, it's only a partly related to what the, to father, okay? So um, that's a harder word to say. In fact, father, the is a very hard sound for kids. It's one of the last acquired in English. So, in fact, many people speak English who do not have the or the uh, at all. So, and they're perfectly fluent speakers of English. So it's a, uh, it's a, not a good word for a baby talk word, uh, something that has the in it. Uh, and, and typically, even if a language has many, many kinds of consonants, they're not typically going to find the most weird, difficult to articulate ones with the basic, like kin terms, or, because it's just it's not functional in that way. Because uh, there's a strong desire for people to construct meaning out of the sequence that kids are making, basically. Do you, do you think then that for oh, any wait, language? Wait, wait, wait. That's the last question. Okay, thanks. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. This is actually a great segue into my question. You mentioned you have children. Um, are they of age where they're speaking? And if so, do you introduce like interesting words into their vocabulary at the, at the, at the breakfast table? And do they have a favorite word if they are speaking? <laughs> well, Dan uh, and Jeremy both have kids that are closer to the acquisition process than mine. My youngest son is 10. So, oh, okay. Yeah, they're, uh, they're very set in their linguistic practices I at see. this point. Um, they actively have a disinterest in anything oh, no. to do with <laughs> Anything you do, they don't want to do. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> they couldn't be less interested in it. Yeah, and Either bo of you? both of us speak one language. Uh, okay. uh, yeah. And uh, unfortunately, I mean, that's what maybe the funniest thing about making this film was for us, <laughs> that neither of us speak any of the languages, or any languages for that matter, besides English. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think uh, he's got to give his son a little bit more credit. He came to see a screening of the film in Boston. And I, I think Greg may not agree with me that he actually liked the movie and seeing his old man up on the screen. Right. But who knows what the Well, he might is. admit it to you, but he'd never say that to me. <laughs> Dad's a movie star, yeah. OK, cool. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks very much, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks uh, for having us. Thanks a lot. Can I make one more comment? Uh, you know, w when we start to do research for a film like this, the first place that we look is Google. I'm not joking. So we wanted to thank you for both having us and also helping us do the research that allows us to make movies. Right. So thank you.